Hi, I'm Florian. This is the Service Design Show, episode 213. Let's get started. Journey maps are great, but they are not the end of the story. We need to go beyond mapping and start managing those journeys. But what does that even mean in practice? Today, we are talking to someone who's walking the walk and will share the good, the bad, and the ugly of journey management with us. Hope you're ready. Hi, if you're new here, welcome to the Service Design Show, where we invite the brightest minds in our field and explore what's needed to design great services that resonate with people, push businesses forward, and honor our planet. Our guest today needs no introduction. Well, actually, he kind of does. Florian Former is back. His last appearance on the show was such a hit that I just had to get him back on. You love the conversation we recorded, and honestly, I did as well. This guy is seriously on a mission. He's a service design lead at Autodesk, a professor at Georgia Tech, talk about a busy schedule, and he's passionate about bridging the gap between design, research, and actually making things happen. Today, Florian's diving deep into journey management with us and how we can all, not just us CX nerds, build momentum and make real impact. Pull out your notebooks and get ready to take some notes. Because in today's conversation, you are going to learn about how to get everyone on board with journey management from the C-suite to the frontline staff. Practical tips for building a successful journey management practice in your organization. Why it's crucial to get granular with your journey management efforts, even down to the most detailed level. The biggest challenges Florian faced in implementing journey management at the organizations he's been at and how to secure buy-in and support for journey management, even if you haven't yet demonstrated its value. Now, one thing that surprised me was how someone at Florian's level, who's dealing with big picture strategy and organizational transformation, still gets so hands-on with the details of journey management. Like this guy is a service design lead, but every now and then he's still in there wrestling with the specifics of individual cards on a journey map. He actually gave a really insightful reason for doing that. And it totally changed how I think about leading these kinds of initiatives. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to get this show on the road. Come along for the ride as Florian helps us to explore the ins and outs of journey management. I'm your host, Mark Fontaine, and you are listening to the Service Design Show. Welcome back to the show, Florian. Hello, I'm excited to be here. You're back for episode, well, uh, we should call it two and a half because there was one <laughs> official interview, there was one sort of special edition, uh, and now you're back to talk about what are we going to explore today, Florian? We're going to explore journey management at enterprise scale and the impact of it. Ah, love it. Who doesn't? Uh, the first time uh, in episode 168, which is about 18 months ago, we talked about um, how to build and scale journey journeys, journey management to over 100 plus journeys. That episode uh, is a really popular one. So well done. Uh, it's apparently striking a chord. Um, in the sort of one and a half episode, we talk about, talked about connecting journeys to business goals. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, journeys and journey management are definitely a theme going through our uh, conversations and happy to continue yeah. there uh, because I'm sure that you've learned a lot over the last 18 months and uh, Lily, looking forward to hearing from you. But uh, Florian, before, uh, well, before, no, let's let's just dive into it because uh, something that would be interesting to share is um, 
maybe a little bit about your background. So for the people who haven't yet had the opportunity to listen to one of the previous episodes, um, what do you do and how does that, how does that relate to journey management? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm service design lead at Autodesk these days, and I'm in a central design group that's responsible for our digital touch, touch points. And Autodesk is in the middle of that digital first transformation. So it's really exciting times to be at that sort of nucleus of that transformation. And in our responsibility, to, we get to work with a lot of different design groups that sit in product, that sit in, over in marketing, that sit in, in the customer success organization. So it's a highly collaborative effort. We're actually strongly partnering with our friends in the customer success organization to stand up this practice. So really grateful for that. My background is originally one of industrial design and sort of these early aspects of, um, you know, systems thinking, applying that and thinking about impact throughout. And over my career, over the last 20 some years, um, I've gotten more and more first into service design and now into journey management to do that in a very structured, um, intentional way. And um, yeah, for the last... Well, for the, for the last um, seven, eight years now, really doing this at enterprise scale, first NCR and now um, Autodesk. And it's, exci- it's, it's very exciting times and we are building the practice. We are learning, we are iterating as we go and uh, we're getting stronger at it. So good times. Yeah, uh, I'm sure, again, a lot has changed in the last 18 months. But uh, just to set the stage and... Um, maybe uh, clarify some definitions and some perspectives. When you say journey management, what do you mean? I mean the analysis and the design of customer journeys through interconnected pieces of information, the input on the one side, the insights, the personas, the business goals on one side, and then very structured the output, the high-level innovation opportunities and the solutions of features that make that happen. And having all these pieces of data interconnected, doing that highly collaborative and the management piece, doing that over time, listening to the success or failure of the experiences that we're designing and bringing that back to the right stakeholders, iterating and managing those journeys over time. And doing that on a like you said, enterprise scale. That's the, yeah. That's, thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Th- well. Yeah. That's the interesting thing because I've started implementing or becoming more journey driven in my small business, uh, and yeah. I'm already experiencing how difficult or how challenging that is. Let alone if you're working in a multi-thousand uh, employee uh, organization. We'll get into that. So, um, Orion. I might be mistaken, uh, but I feel that let's call it the buzz or the momentum around journey management is picking up. Do you feel yeah. the same? I very much feel the same. Um, I feel like when when I got first into it, sort of informally um, around 2019, and then more formally 2000 2001. Um, there was very few people that used that term. Um, I did a series of interviews and, and, and did, did some did some poking around, and it was an early signal. I, I wrote about that, um, and now uh, in the service design community, in the customer experience community, and in some other communities, journey management has really, really picked up as a term, as an activity, as a mindset, and as a process. Any guesses on what's driving this momentum? Why now? I think that some things are coming together. Um, two or three pieces I see driving this. Um, one is service design as a core activity um, is impactful. And I've heard more and more in the community sort of, okay, you do a service design project and then what? And service designers and you, several guests on your show have, have talked about this, analyzed this, the you know, demonstrating the business value of service design over time and the hard measures that we can, the hard metrics that we may have and the more squishy metrics are the absence of metrics. So service design continues to be hard to grasp, a little bit hard to grasp for the business community. So, so, so that's one side, right? Then we're seeing something similar with um, design thinking or human-centered design, 
where the I would say over the last 20 years, the business community almost over-indexed on that and saw it as a as a heal it all kind of thing. Uh, and we've seen sort of, um, you know, a little bit of the bigger disillusionment on that. And I think it is ma- mostly because people... In, really indexed on the first diamond, the ideation and the high level thing, but then never really pushed it all the way through into execution, through experimentation, through learning, right? And then the third piece is um, design systems and and UX. Um, it, it this may be controversial, but it's getting easier to design on screen experiences with the emergence and the proliferation of design systems. So we have, I see um, UX designers that are moving more strategic, moving more upstream. How do they do that? Where do they do that? Enter journey management in, in the middle, really solving for design thinking on one side and helping these ideas become, um, uh, helping these ideas go in, into the execution and giving it a bridge into execution for service design pretty similar, having repeatable approaches, having visibility, having something that I would call the through line from early discovery all the way to what did we actually do about it and making that traceable through that database structure. And then last but not least, giving UX designers, full stack designers, a tool to think more strategic or a method to think more strategic across multiple touch points and then communicating that um, together with service designers um, in in one place and and if you are asking me is is does is it only a service designer that can do that the answer would be absolutely not and when you say can do that what do you mean specifically is it only service designers that can do journey management and can engage in a journey management team I see that as an I see journey management as an orchestration of many brilliant minds together um, business stakeholders designers engineering and so and so forth and all of what we are pushing is more and more actual editors, actual contributors on the platform that we're using and becoming part of the process, not the internal customer or the internal client of that process, if you will. Different mindset. So let's double click on that because um, I hope a lot of listeners will agree with you that this isn't something that they per se want to own. Um, The map isn't theirs they want the organization to participate now let's talk about the the difficulties because mapping isn't the difficulty the difficulty is getting those other collaborators those other stakeholders to actually start adopting this mindset to start using these tools and whenever i talk to well people who are in-house in these organizations and are sort of very eager to get this going, one of the biggest roadblocks they face is, well, it's not a spreadsheet. It's not a PowerPoint. People won't, like, there is no, there is no room for acceptance. So th- take us through how you have managed to crack the code and get this on a organizational scale. I think it comes down to, if I want to say it very brief, it's adaptability. Adaptability of a mindset. And I'm I'm not walking into these meetings with like, here's the process, and here is the playbook, and here's the checklist, and here's exactly what has to happen. It's more like, okay, I know I, I have a method and an approach and a platform that I trust. Let's understand the problem. Let's understand the situation in which a stakeholder is in and then adapt to their specific situation. Um, As an example, in the last half year, um, I've I've worked with somebody who's just investigating the new employee laptop delivery process, very much like a, a very detailed, very level two, level three in our hierarchy um, journey. And then um, in the last few we- few weeks and months here, we've been involved in like strategic planning for a f- few years in the future. So very strategic um, journeys there. And obviously they, deliver, they, they require different um, approaches and different artifacts. But once I understand that a little bit, I can go in and help transposing other ways of working, other artifacts that may exist and say, hey, here is how this may look like. So... 
I've taken an Excel and just done done the on the ground work and give me a weekend, give me a few evening hours and let me just go through the nitty gritty work that it is to transpose something from A to B and then make those connections that I spoke of earlier and then come back and say, say see, here is the same information that you had before, except it is now connected to 15 research insights, except it is now connected to something that you can use in your next product planning meeting. And here it is. Um, it, it, I'm making it a lot easier for you to use now. I did something similar with a Figma file the other day. So, it, so it is sort of the mindset. We talk about it a lot in, 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 the, in the journey management practice. We're doing it for them. Then we're doing it with them. And then eventually we're setting them free to do it by themselves. And um, the interesting, it sort of manifests right now. We've, we've, we've put up um, a journey management SharePoint in our world, Microsoft Shop, doesn't matter, a Microsoft internal, uh, sorry, a, a journey management internal information page. Let's just keep it there. Right now, the only thing that we have on there is expectation setting that we, what do we want for people that are just commenting on, on our journeys? And what do we want for people that are just looking at journeys? We're not even getting into the editor's right, editor side of things right now. We are just really saying we're going to do this for you right now and then coaching you coaching you on a one-by-one -one basis. Um, that's how from the ground up it has to be. To, to add, so, and it is a, it's, it is a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach. So we're getting a lot of excitement now at the VP, EVP level and beyond um, to say, okay, you know what, there is, this is a thing that we want to embrace cross-functionally. And so sort of all the details that I just described here with that top-level support, now we're getting um, really beautiful, um, to use a corporate word, velocity in, in adoption. This is really interesting because... Um... This is sort of the tension that I think a lot of professionals face of having to do the very granular, detailed, operational oriented work. And at the same time, uh, thinking and structuring like, okay, how would we potentially roll this out and make this the single source of truth in the organization? How do you balance those two things? Yeah, so on, as a leader in this space, um, it is hard. I will just go on record and say that it is it is a hard thing to to do that context switching all the time to do the altitude switching. In the states, we, we talk about like a two thousand to twenty thousand foot level of altitude, and I extend that and say two hundred feet to two hundred thousand feet of altitude. That's where I find myself operating, and so it it is it is difficult. It is exhausting. It re requires me to go through some of the fuzzy front end where I'm just learning about the stakeholders to some pretty rigorous process documentation and everything in between. So it it isn't easy. And as, as a leader, I still find myself being sort of, um, to use another analogy, a trainer, trainer, coach, a trainer, player, coach, player to, to really do both. Um, we, we have built a, a, a really, really very talented team. And um, that that's, that's the next level of work right now that, that that we're looking at. How do we define these roles to be really future proof? And what are we? What is the value of journey management? It is bringing the right information to the right people to make the right decisions. Right. That's ultimately, if we break it down to something really simple. That's that's what it is. So um, I've gone back. Honestly, I've gone back and forth a little bit in terms of the team structure. Do we want to have specific journey managers and then specific service designers? And these people do this over here. These people um, are more the creative and put put the service concepts together and that kind of thing. And um, where where we're landing is that I think there's huge value in having a journey manager service design hybrid, somebody who can do the research, somebody who can do the abductive and deductive thinking to put together new proposals of new experiences and also has that sort of side of themselves to be interested in working in a very structured and cataloging librarian way, but they can switch between these two, two mindsets. So in the, in, the, in the team design, that's what we're looking at for our um, for our core contributors. And then there's something, don't want to throw another um, 
buzzword in the, into the into the mix. But there's a, a journey management role that's more operationally operational leaning um, that we also need. People that look over the data integrity, the quality of the journeys themselves. People that look over the data integrity, the quality of the different connected repositories. So just going in and saying, is, is our insights repository actually up to date? Are there pieces of information that we may have to just let expire? Are there pieces of information that are get, getting a little old and that may um, warrant a new research project or the instrumentation of a new analytics tool or whatever the case may be? And then the same thing, obviously, on the opportunities and, pro and, and, and solutions side, are we connected with the product roadmaps? Is everything in sync? Uh, are we do we, are we are we in, in good communications with everybody? So from a team design, I'm 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 working towards a future where there's less context switching, but to be an effective journey manager, I'd say we we need to be comfortable with some amount of context switching. Which uh, I'm really interested in your thoughts about the team. Um, what was your perspective maybe i don't know three years ago how did you then think about the roles and maybe capabilities that you needed and how has that shifted and why is that yeah shifted? i think yeah so the core value that i described earlier acting on the right information connected at the right time and also the consistency of experience um, across multiple touch points or the intentional difference of different experiences across multiple touch points, but that orchestration of the multiple touch points with an end-to-end -end view. And I think that drove the biggest evolution here in the team design, where in a, in a previous um, life, we were maybe more, um, more organized by just the buy phase of the B2B experience and then the support phase of the B2B experience. And we're sort of shifting the orientation a little bit from a more vertical orientation to a more horizontal orientation where we look at all the, say, get help experiences. Um, we have a strong partner community out there. So all the partner experiences, what, what, what do, they, do they look like along the end to end life cycle? So that there's sort of the, the reorientation from vertical to, to horizontal with, of course, still needing to look at the, the vertic vertical as well. And then the other one that I spoke of um, uh, earlier already, so this evolution from saying, okay, in the past, we had a, a few service designers that were more acting as internal customers of the journey management framework. And then we had people that were, you know, more responsible for the journey management framework, the approach, the method, and so forth. And what that led to is, is was good data quality but not great data quality so if if the if the if the if the designer that's responsible for the designing the new experiences is not also um, responsible for the quality of the information on the platform you, you're getting into some of the same issues that agile in the software development world um, seek to solve um, you know a while ago so that shared responsibility for for doing and assuring the quality is there. That's that's what's um, you know reflected in the new team topology. Can you can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean with data quality? What what does good versus great quality mean for you? Yeah, um, in in any of the and now maybe we're getting a little bit more technical, but we do, I think for journey management you need some sort of dedicated uh, platform, purpose built platform, and. The, easy, the simplest I can break that down is um, having data on there that doesn't have any dead ends. What do I mean with that? Um, I mean, if I click onto a journey, I want to be able to click onto a step in a journey. I want to see the there's job to be done, and then I want to see the underlying pain point, and I want to then be able to click on the pain point and see all the pieces of insight, quant, qual, primary, secondary, or however you want to classify that, that drive that pain point. So I can understand, you know what, this is an anecdotal pain point right now, and we need to do a little bit more of a, a, a quantitative analysis here, or we need to increase the sample size of the interviews, or what, whatever the case may be. So I can understand that there, and that I'm, not, I'm not ending up in any dead ends, and then I can understand it on the other side as well and go into my opportunity, my how might we statement and say, okay, you know what, that how might we statement, we validated that with this group of um, uh, product leaders, with this group of engineers, with this group of design leaders. Okay, cool. We 
validated that, we sized that. And now in a subsequent session, we broke that down in this set into this set of solutions. And these solutions are, again, sized, validated, and then often linked into JIRA issues, right? So I have that, again, I have the ability to see, to see that through line. And early days, a few years back, that through line wasn't always there right? You would get to an opportunity. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's a great opportunity. And what are we doing about it? And that what are we doing about it may have been more in a PowerPoint deck or in, an, in a, or in a, in a how, how conversation or in an email or Slack, but not connected to the core journey management framework. And I, and I believe that data integrity to really see the whole picture, really see that through line is just one of the major value propositions for business. This, uh, we talked about this uh, in our previous conversation, but uh, this is a, a little bit of a, ch a chicken and an egg issue. Uh, getting the, the data quality up to uh, a high standard that you can actually make better decisions, faster decisions, smarter decisions uh, requires an investment. And investing in something that's quote unquote unproven or that it is at least not familiar. Um, a lot of organizations aren't yet comfortable making that investment. Like, how do you go about those conversations? It is, um, it's, it's a mixture of organic conversations and then um, top-down prioritization as well. So um, in, in this context here at Autodesk, we are, we are very fortunate that we're in the middle of this transformation that I described earlier, and that we're also, that the organization is putting a lot of emphasis on customer-first thinking and associated tooling. So we can actually tap into a, strat a strategic realization theme, a strategic realization topic that's, uh, you know, we want to learn more and act more on the voice of the customer. And obviously we can bring um, journey management into that as a, as a value proposition at, the, uh, at that level and get a certain amount of um, funding and staffing there. And again, I want to highlight here the cross-functional nature. So we have the core digital design team that I'm part of by reporting lines, and then we have a customer success design team that reports up into the CS organization. And we, we came together when I, when I joined Autodesk and said, hey, okay, let's form this joint practice for the benefit of all under a, a one Autodesk mindset. So funding comes from that group and it comes from, from, from our group. And um, it is very much uh, the case that um, I'm showing an evolution. Um, I'm working more with traditional um, ratios between a um, UX team and how many how many ops people do we need for a UX team? How many service designers do we need? How many researchers do we need? The, we're still loosely modeling things after design orgs, uh, org design for design orgs. That's the book. Um, so so there are ratios in there that we can use to sort of spitball and then go from there. And then my approach is often to, and we fought for the business proposition to make that investment into the software platform. And we, we built a business case and said, hey, okay, this is, let us do this for X amount of time and run this as a pilot and we'll prove the value to you. Can you make this investment proactively? And we find, look, the, 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 the fortunate thing is like Autodesk is there to support the world's innovators. That's our customer base. And the internal culture is there to support innovative mindset, to support experimentation. So the culture is there to, to make some proactive uh, investments. So Am I perhaps a little spoiled there compared compared to an, an old fashioned company that is like where it's more of a, it's like maybe that's the case, but I think there are so this proactive investment and in saying okay you know let us let us try it as a pilot I think that's that that any co any company with a good culture should be supportive of at least running a well funded pilot with clear goals and milestones, and then but the other part that I want to get to and then I'll shut up is um, having a more traditional like the, the, the traditional ratios of a service design team but then doing a lot more right and saying okay we, we're doing the service design work and also we're just embracing that journey management mindset and surprise here is the output in a journey management format connected did you expect that no okay cool now are you excited yes can we can we have more of it yes let's go 
And so that's a lot of that. This is, again, I'm going to reference back to our previous conversation. Uh, this is sort of the, not per se the Trojan horse, but um, don't wait for permission uh, to start doing this type of work. Just do it as a side benefit of what you're doing anyway, incorporate it in your work. I think that's what you said the last time. And then sl slowly but surely build it, like see it as part of your, your own work without asking for permission. And is that correct? Certainly that, in, as you said it, that was correct uh, at the other company, at NCR, the previous company. Uh, asking for a lot more um, mandate and visibility at the beginning here. But still, I'm um, just I just have a I just have a mindset of just doing it and and, and just going for it and get, creating excitement around it, um, and just saying, hey, here's how we should do it, and here's why. Let's go, and 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 people are getting absorbed with this in, into this energy and are, are, are very very supportive of it. And also on the project delivery side, ultimately we have a dream of working slide free. Okay. Um, and 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 really just and and do I dare say presentation free, right? Um, just having work sessions and 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 being in the data, being in the cards, working together. And we're not there yet. We we, we the mindset is not there yet. Um, some of the tooling may not be as responsive as we would wish it to be from a performance perspective. So okay, do we do we grab screen grabs of of certain areas of a map or of a list of opportunities and put them into a PowerPoint and have more of a click through thing? Yes, we do. Um, is that a stepping stone? Yes, it is a stepping stone. And and we're we're building our muscle, our trust, and getting people used to seeing information not in a PowerPoint list, but in a journey management tool list, but still using PowerPoint as a wrapper to have that same behavior in the conversation and then moving it, moving it over time. And also, I think the a big difference to the previous implementation is um, getting ahead with the contributors, getting ahead with the editors and having very much an open journey management mindset and saying, you know what? Uh, the the data on here the, the the journey architecture is it's it's great it's it's good let's just say that it's not great yet there are a few orphan journeys still on there that we need to take care of and we get that but here's the orientation and here's the journey we would like you to look at and here's the swim lane in the journey we would like you to look at and here dear ux researcher can you use the comment function right in the tool to add mention me whenever you see something that is not accurate uh, or whenever you see, uh, can you put a link in from a previous research study that may be relevant for this and so forth. So shifting the place of collaboration into the tool from Slack, from email, from wikis, and, and, and having more and more data right there, that is greatly accelerated um, the way um, we work, the way it's adopted. And there's a side effect of this, right? The the The... the the, the trust question comes up. The quality question comes up. You look at an opportunity, you look at an insight, and you may have not looked at it for half a year or a year. And then depending on whether that person is still in the organization or has moved to elsewhere in the organization, uh, it may not be self-evident what that card actually represents. And then having a conversation right on the card, having a history on the card is a, at the front end, it makes collaboration faster, more seamless and modern. But B, it acts as a archive and a trust builder over time. The interesting thing here is that uh, we have have had a conversation in our field for many, many years as uh, to the question, who owns the journey or who's responsible for the journey? And we've been going back and forth on that question where maybe initially we said, yeah, it's the service design professional who owns the journey. Then it was, no, no, everybody owns the journey. Um, and now what I'm hearing you say is there needs to be somebody who is responsible for the quality of the journey, uh, for the integrity of the journey, maybe not per se owning the journey. That It would be interesting to explore like how those two things are related. Um, and I'll give you a practical example from, uh, again, me trying to implement this in my tiny business. So we are looking and using uh, journeys, for instance, to think about how 
specific sessions or workshops or gathering are hosted within our community. And we have a small working group that is using journeys and mapping the journey. And what I'm seeing right now is that there are four people, just four people uh, who are involved with this journey. And somebody gets an idea. Let's say I, over the weekend, think, you know what, a checklist might be a good idea. Um, instead of going into the journey, I fall into the trap of sharing this, uh, in our case, on Discord, but it could be Slack, whatever. And I don't add it to the journey. So uh, again, the question of responsibility, like who who should add what, who, who manages, who has the uh, authority to do these things. Um, let's get back to the question. The question here is like, how do you see this? Like, what is, who, who does this? How do you see those roles? So ultimately, this comes down to an organization-specific and, and relevant journey taxonomy. Um, so this notion of, like, like in our world, it's a, it's a level 0, 1, 2, and 3 journey taxonomy that we've developed, and we're looking to the outside world to stay consistent or, or like get inspired by what everybody else is doing to not reinvent the wheel. Um, level 0, the high-level executive-oriented um, end-to-end journeys. Level 1, zooming in a little bit more. Level 2, zooming in more. Level 3, the, the task the flow level, often that will happen over in Figma, actually, just to give you an idea how that, how that is structured. And then journey owners depend on the, on the taxonomy, on the architecture, and on the altitude level. So we are, in, in, in my group, we are organized by, by domains. We are organized by the marketing and consider domain, then the buy domain and then the customer success or use domain and, and, and product management is organized along those same lines. And so um, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, there are journey segments that are owned ultimately. Um, ultimately, they need to be owned by product, I would think, at that level. Um, so, so that because they're ultimately responsible for delivering those experiences, but they're in strong partnership with um, our service designers to to work at at that level. The for me, the the more at this scale that we're working, the 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 daily question that is a lot more relevant is the the ownership of the of the cards of the pieces of information that are on there. And that's that's where we've gotten really intentional and in saying, okay, an insights card is owned by this UX researcher that has this orientation and, and, and a card that represents analytics uh, and some tooling and full story and so forth, that's owned by a stakeholder in that group. And then the opportunity cards are owned um, by, 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 owned by product. And then the solution cards are owned by by, by designers typically. So th- so you get to that to that level of ownership at the card level, and and love it or hate it, we are just saying you can only have one owner, and to, to force that hard conversation and to not have you know a shared sense of ownership, and then nobody owns it in the end. So I realize this is a semi good answer because i didn't answer ultimately who who should own the journeys at any of those levels but i, I do think that i want to sort of reorient from the journey ownership as maybe the big question to ultimately the most if we're concerned about execution it's at the card level one more thing we are also as we, as i'm describing the sort of um, vertical to horizontal reorientation of the teams we're coming in with this concept of swim lane owners so having owners that own ultimately the digital experience to the customer out there, having owners that are more connected to the partner experience, having owners that are more connected to the underlying employee experience, and then making those vertical connections. What you're describing here um, is beautiful. At the same time, it's, um, it's an organizational transformation that's going on. Um, this will be very daunting for many of us listening to your story. Um, they're not ready. They're, they will never be maybe ready. They don't want to. Um, what, what do we do in those situations where there isn't yet the momentum to make this 
go into this organizational shift. Yeah, and to be to be clear, I'm 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 not so foolish as to walk into a new environment and say, "Hey, we need to go through an organizational transformation." That is not the conversation. You're correctly picking up on that. Some of the underlying things have the qualities of an organizational transformation. We do need to work differently. We are embracing um, experimentation, culture of experimentation. We are embracing uh, a way of you know doing risk taking and doing things in new and different ways, and uh, we have for a long time. We can tap into that all day long, and and as we break down any of these activities that I'm describing into more of a project size, which we still need to do to give it a beginning and an end, so sex, metri so sex metrics and all that stuff. It is at that level that we can say, that I can say, and I, I am saying often, okay, what, what can we do a little bit differently? How can we drive this evolution into this new way of working? And it is that, at that level that we can then say, okay, you know what, here's what worked, here's what didn't work. And, um, And we, we we step into it. So we we just did a internal design um, review um, with all the designers that are in the group, and uh, we just oriented the entire design review along the end to end journey. Okay, it was very well received. Uh, lots of good energy, lots of good aha moments around that review. Just coming together for a day, essentially, and saying, "Hey, let's just look at the end to end and look at all the." UX design projects that we've been doing along this journey um, and just getting end-to-end -end visibility to everybody. Um, and we discovered that we needed a little more metrics here, that, um, a little bit less information over here. And so it's this mindset of experimentation that we are we're doing at that level. And then coming back to the trans... And this is a signifier of that transformation of that journey first um, working and thinking, and we can, I can point to several several working groups that have tapped into new collaborators based on that design review, and uh, they're looking at getting information in a different way. They're looking at experimentation in a different way. So these these bubbles of transformation are popping up. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. First of all, uh, really interesting. Um, If you sort of have to look back on your last 18 months and maybe summarize some of the key lessons, what what would you say? What have you learned? Yeah, what have you? What what are the biggest lessons from the last 18 months? I think the biggest lesson for myself personally, and I'm going to get pretty personal here for a second, is to just have compassion with myself, to say, you know what, this is something that we're driving that has tentacles in so many different areas and and every day is a, is an exercise of prioritizing and every day i will have moments at various times of the day or the night where i question whether i put my energy into the right place and just sort of grounding myself and saying you know what we're creating something that's pretty brand new and we 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 we're, we're building something as we're building the underlying mechanism as as we're using it as we're shown um, value it's no small feat and so so that compassion I, I'm, i'm some days i'm really good at it some some days i'm not um so learned that uh, i'm really formalizing the people aspect of it and understanding that by extension uh, it needs a pretty special almost unicorn of a person that has both the hunter and the gardener in them to use one analogy um and um and re realizing that not every person in the design profession um or in the business community uh, in the cs community is 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 built for that and and also being a lot more overt about communicating that in any kind of contracting or hiring conversation And then, and then, um, I'd say biggest patience, uh, biggest, one of the biggest lessons is sort of <laughs> urgent patience that I've developed, and say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to help you get there as a new team member. And yes, what you thought journey management was as an, as this term that we discussed, and then journey management in the trenches may look a little bit differently, and um, having the patience to steer and develop individuals that way. 
Um, that's been something that I really need to sort of anchor myself on. And uh, I think we've, we've gotten pretty good at that in, in, in our group now. And then the, the other big learning is the, the trans, oh, this is the right word. I'm, I'm looking into distance and thinking the, um, the open collaborator mindset, maybe bring, in other words, um, when, in, in the old world, we had maybe um, a service designer would present to, to me, I would present to the design lead, the design lead would then present to the EVP or whatnot. Um, we're breaking that and we're having design, we're having journey reviews and journey update meetings that go all the way up to to the EVP level and having, having that level of leader in the journeys for direct feedback, for direct uh, conversations. And um, that's that's been very, very powerful. So... I'm hearing you say being more compassionate, being uh, urgently patient, uh, making the distinction between journey management on paper versus in the trenches, uh, open collaborators. How, like, I'm, I'm very curious about your experience with regards to the journey management on paper versus in the trenches. Like, what are those differences? I think it does come down to this concept that we discussed a, a couple of times that there is a certain um, element of context switching needed every every day, and and working as a researcher one day or working with a research team, then working as a designer or working with a design team, and then working as a librarian bringing things together in in this structure. The cognitive description of that we can have all day long, but how that uh, and we have. In, in in the job descriptions, in the hiring, in the interview questions, and all that stuff, but how that feels on a day by day basis that's the, that's the aspect of the in the trenches that that I that I see people like oh oh you mean I actually need to do A B and C in my job yes you do uh, and and um, that that is the bigger aha moment um, so it's m maybe more about the feel than the the abstract description and what so what surprises people when you say the feel how how does it feel different i think it's just uh cognitively exhausting sometimes to 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 work at these different levels and and look many of the people in, in the service and community in, in, in cx and business consulting and otherwise um their context switch often every day and and we in our private lives and <laughs> context switch every day so um I think mileage mileage varies there, and how different it feels. But I've seen it firsthand that um, I've had some, uh, some people that joined and be like, "Oh, yeah, no, this was not what I ex was expecting." But I, I get it. Let me let me adjust to the new environment. Interesting. I, again, I'm experiencing this um, myself when trying to set up this journey centric way of working. That you have to at some point get super granular, and indeed spend hours in a journey thinking about the title of a card and at the same time you have to think about the okrs for this year and how you're going to measure that and like that's you have to do both at, at least that that's for me and i'm hearing you say that that's the case for a lot of people yeah and I also want to sort of go on record here and be like journey management is a powerful tool but let's stay away from looking at journey management as as a hammer, and then all that sudden everything looks like a nail, and you have to use journey man management for for everything. That is not the case, right? In in my practice, and in, in my personal practice and prioritization, and then in our practice, there's many instances where we just sort of say, okay, how do we index from the journey management framework, and then we just have a link out to something else. And and yes, that's something else we could spend like two weeks and making that. A journey or a repository or a set of cards in but it, the reality is that it's, it's not it's not worth it um so just being sort of adaptable and flexible uh what makes sense to integrate and what doesn't um is is certainly one piece and then the other the other thing that i want to um highlight here is this notion of like yeah, fast and slow thinking and and you and, and what are the thinking and the decision making tools? What are they for us as an as an individual? If I need to think something through, um, even if it involves numbers, I just sometimes just get my good old 
paper notebook and just use two or three pages and just jot things out because nothing gets in the way of thinking. If I'm in a fancy journey management tool and I have to think about connecting this and connecting that and connecting that, that is very good for certain thought processes and certain decision-making processes. And it's gets in the way, I would say, for some some other decision-making. So the more the more personalized, the smaller decision-making processes can get in the way. Um, so being being intentional with the tooling too. Okay, we've we've exported journeys back into a mural or a Miro or FigJam just to sort of say, okay, you know what, in this session we need to just move things around and question the status quo and it needs some disruptive thinking. And it's really hard to have disruptive thinking in essentially what boils down to to, to columns and rows, right? Um, so just sort of stepping back for a second and say, what are we seeking to accomplish and what is the right tool, the right method for the, for the situation at hand? I recall a conversation that I had many times with Johan van der Veer from Deidu and he was hammering on uh, to for me to think about and reflect upon, okay, what are the moments that you make decisions inside your business and think about how a journey, if a journey could help there. And I was like, I have to say, initially, I was like com maybe a little bit confused and annoyed, like I didn't understand it to, up to the moment that I started using, trying to make these journeys and think in a journey-centric way. And then I realized, like, if I'm not explicit and clear about, okay, so when do I need to have this information? Um, the journey is, it's not useless, but it, it's so much less valuable. Now, I know every quarter, at the end of the quarter, I need to make plans for what are we going to focus on next. That's the moment there that I need the information. And I'm hearing you say something similar. When you understand obviously what needs to get done and what the roadblocks or challenges are or things that slow down that decision-making process or that could accelerate it, that's the moment where you can sort of really start adding value and think, being strategic about using journeys. Long story, but does that make sense? It does make sense. And this points to an area that we have not explored at all in this conversation, and that is the cadences and overarching process. And... Um, we, we've developed a circular model that says, okay, here's a listening phase, then here's, an, then here's an, a synthesis phase and saying, okay, here are what the opportunities are that are emerging. Then that feeds into a specific, into essentially solution identification and experimentation, uh, sort of under the, with the mindset of earlier experimentation, not just code-based experimentation, shipping and A-B testing, multivariate testing, but doing that early in the process with with sort of concepts, prototypes, and so forth, then and then using it to build, to design and build, and then measure again, and then repeating that, right? And we all have a model of sorts there, um, double diamond, triple diamond, whatever you have. What was important for me is sort of depicting the circular nature for it. And then this gets into the, the altitude conversation, sort of the level zero, one, two. But we are we also have a mental model of sort of interlocking wheels, uh, circles that are spinning next to each other and informing each other at different speeds. So a sprint team may run this at a two-week cycle, right? Some of the teams that are in a trans more, more like transforming to modern delivery methods, they may run some in a two, three month cycle. Somebody who's doing a like vision work for the future may run this cycle on a year or longer. And each time between each of these cycles, there's information that comes up for the different teams that are collaborating. So we're having this sort of orchestration model there, what information needs to go to where. And this is <laughs> this is good, where the management of it all gets really um, challenging and entertaining all at the same time. It's easy to get overwhelmed. And I think uh, to come back to what you said earlier, it's important to have some compassion uh, with yourself there. Uh, it is complex. Uh, it is complicated. It is a lot. Um, nobody has gotten this right yet. So don't put too much pressure on yourself. Um, well, there are many things we can still double click on, but uh, we're almost running out of time. In our previous conversation, we talked about 
mostly how you get to have an overview of a hundred plus journeys. So that was maybe a bit more technical and a bit more um, operational. We talked about Airtable, I remember, and how to move from that. Uh, we talked about connecting journeys to business goals in a different conversation. Today, we maybe focus more on, well, I think that is a good summary, the the difference between journey management on paper and in the trenches and that there it's not just it's not just about the tools there's a lot of personal development going on there expectations um if you would have another conversation in 18 months what do you hope you would be exploring in that conversation i would hope we are talking about how to take it to the next level with business stakeholders what i what i see as early signals the way the journey management community is coming together uh, getting to a nice level of consistency and saying here are the interlocking journeys here's the data connectivity here are the repositories input output i see some more common patterns in the language that the global practitioners are using which is really cool because i see journey management as sort of the next UX, if we are disciplined enough to solidify the approach as a global community and make it really easy for business stakeholders to understand, okay, yeah, you know what? Engaging with journey management in discovery means this. Engaging with journey management in delivery means this and, and so forth. So I think I think we are on a good way, on a good trajectory there. Um, and that I'm looking forward to that conversation because I think it will happen. Do you have any recommended resources or if people are interested in digging a bit deeper into this, uh, where would you direct them to? We uh, we have a little sub stack going now with a, a few folks, um, the Journey Management Alliance. Um, I'll send the link over for you to put in the show notes. Um, there are some different aspects of journey management from multiple perspectives um, in, in there. Um, yeah, I'd invite people to check out the, the previous videos that you referenced a couple of times now as well on on here. Um, in terms of, we still there's not not really a book yet on the discipline. Um, a few people are, are working on it, um, so stay tuned for stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, those would be the key resources that I can point you to right now. And um, P.S. Uh, in the spring, um, I taught the first, uh, one of the first journey management courses at graduate level, specific journey management. And we worked with a nonprofit uh, to look at their discovery journey, as their rec uh, member recruitment journey, at the professional participation journey, and so forth. And the, the group of students, 20, they started to really work as one big design agency. It was beautiful how they connected all the different pieces of the puzzle. Um, and the plug here that I would say, um, these Georgia Tech courses are always so much better if we have a real world partner like we had in the spring. And we're looking for partners going into this next spring. So reach out to me if that may be of interest. What's the best way to reach out? Um, on LinkedIn. And we'll make sure that link to LinkedIn is available in the show notes. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Florian, I do hope that our conversation, that our journey around journey management continues. Uh, I'm quite uh, excited to see where this is going, uh, following it very closely. So uh, thank you for coming back on, uh, continuing to share your wins and your hmm, failures or challenges or your struggles. Uh, that's the, that's the stuff that we learn the most from. So, uh, thanks again. Yeah. Super excited. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate that Florian's honesty about how hard journey management work can be. It takes dedication, perseverance, and a whole lot of hustle. And sometimes in the midst of that all, we forget to take care of ourselves. So I think Florian was spot on when he talked about having compassion for ourselves. Let's remember to acknowledge the effort we put in and be kind to ourselves along the way. A big shout out to Florian for keeping it real. Always a pleasure to have him on the Service Design Show. If you enjoyed today's conversation, you can do me one huge favor. Click the like button on this video and leave a short comment if you haven't done so already. 
No, not to feed the YouTube algorithm, but rather to let me know whether we are on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you are going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.